All right, I see my, my tech team has started our live Facebook feed. So I think we'll go ahead and get started here. Uh, good morning, folks. My name is Zach Nicklin. Uh, I'm the co-PI for the National Center for Autonomous Technologies. I'm also uh, a faculty member at Northland Community and Technical College uh, here in Northwest Minnesota, uh, way up in Thief River Falls. Today we have with us Curtis Zoller. Curtis Zoller is the Associate Dean of Aerospace and Ag Programs here at Northland Community and Technical College. And I know that uh, most folks are focusing on, on public safety programs today. Uh, but again, as I said a second ago, we're going we're gonna to take a slightly different tack. And we're going to talk about uh, what Northland College has done with their UAS program. Specifically, uh, we're, we're going to look at some of their, their large UAS programming as well, which is one of the only places in the country that offers this type of thing. Um, so if you have any questions, please feel free to throw them in the chat. I'll be monitoring the chat here. And uh, as we get some natural pauses, we'll, we'll be able to answer some of those. Uh, otherwise, we'll have some time at the end as well. So Curtis Zoller, welcome. So thank you for, uh, for letting me be here today. Like I said, I'm um, very, very excited about uh, the work the National Center is doing and the team there. And again, I'm uh, very honored to be here today and, and to get a couple of plugs in here for Northland and, and the, uh, the training program. We're, we're the one and only, as they say, the mythical uh, large <laughs> So um, anyway, we'll go ahead and get started here. My goal today, uh, we'll talk through a quick introduction of who Northland is, uh, what our programs are. And then from there, uh, we'll dive into the program itself and talk about some of the special considerations. And then we'll get into the accrediting bodies a little bit and, and what certificates. Uh, anyone that would be looking to watch a new program uh, might be uh, interested in, in, uh, in recognizing or taking into consideration as they develop curriculum. And for those that didn't catch that at the beginning, I'm a little luckier here because I'm backed up, of course, by Zach Nicklin, our moderator, who also is the uh, principal uh, faculty member uh, for the program. So we may kind of have a little bit of banter going back and forth on, on any kind of questions or, or things like that. So it makes my job really easy today. All right. Well, Kurt, let's start, uh, let's start one step back, though. Um, tell us just a little bit about yourself and, and how you came to be here. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Well, I started off by... Again, started in the military, uh, like a lot of folks that got into the drone industry. Um, again, we started off as an avionics technician working on uh, Black Hawks and Cobras. Uh, from there, I got over into uh, flying drones and operating uh, the Shadow um, RQ-7 system, which, again, was one of the first you know, large, I guess, significant systems that the Army operated for quite a few years. Uh, from there, I got into safety and standardization of uh, the drone systems across the board. I uh, really focused on uh, developing teams and training and, and uh, became a warrant officer in the Army um, as a part of that process. Uh, from there, I got into command and control of the airspace. And again, I moved up to a, a larger uh, level at the battalion side where we worked a lot with, um, I guess, understanding how drones work within a larger system. Um, and of course, certainly helped, um, I guess, as we looked at Northland College and some of the ways that now systems are being used across uh, the civilian industry. Um, I started with Northland Community Technical College in 2011 as a program manager uh, to watch the unmanned uh, maintenance training program here. And again, it's been uh, an interesting ride over the last uh, 10 years as we've developed this and, and a couple other programs that we'll talk about today. So uh, again, excited to be here and thank you. Great, well, tell us a little about your programs. All right, well, again, Northland Aerospace, as you can see on the screen, again, our vision, pretty straightforward, national recognized, recognized programs. Uh, that are driven by industry. And again, uh, knowledge, skill, and innovation is what we talk about with all of our students, you know, the, the core of what it takes to, to move forward in, in the industry that every day it seems like it's changing. And again, the technicians seem like they have an impact on not just their local operations, but, you know, new and, and innovative ways to use uh, drones across uh, the industry, uh, which, which seems to be prevalent. Again, something new every day. Uh, we are part of the Minnesota State System, which is a large system across uh, the entire state, uh, 30 colleges. Uh, seven universities, and I, and I bring this up because uh, one of the reasons why we have been as successful, you know, as we are, uh, is, is because of this large um, set of uh, partners that we have across a, a variety of industries and, and specialties. Uh, you name it, you know, whether it's medical, uh, technical, uh, liberal arts, uh, if you can name the program, I guarantee you uh, we have a set of resident experts somewhere in the state that we can lean on uh, to, move, uh, to move our programs forward and, of course, to offer the best training uh, that we can here at Northland. Northland College itself is built of uh, three different sites, primarily. You know, we've got a, an East Grand Forks site, a uh, Thief River Falls site, 
And then of course, um, the aviation site, which is where the aerospace programs reside. Again, uh, very affordable programming. Uh, the majority of our, our programs here are about 5,500 a year or so, uh, which is uh, pretty fantastic considering uh, the innovative programs that we offer. Uh, and again, the fact that we do offer 110 certificates and diplomas and degrees, again, speaks to the variety that we offer here at, all, at both campuses. Again, uh, technical programs, liberal arts programs, of course, aerospace programs, uh, which will buy them more here. Uh, but again, we lean on each other to really understand uh, the, uh, the faculties around uh, you know, training and, and understanding uh, how, to, how to really produce uh, quality technicians. The Northland Aerospace Resources themselves uh, make up, of course, the airframe power plant program, uh, which again, we'll dive into here in a minute, uh, the UAS maintenance program. Uh, we also have the small UAS programs, which we won't talk a little, as much about today, uh, but again, the operations and maintenance, uh, which again, means something different every day, uh, whether we're talking about, uh, you know, going through and, and inspecting bridges or supporting law enforcement, uh, the small UAS world or the drone world, if you will, uh, really has, uh, you know, significantly impacted our daily lives. And again, I think it will continue to do so as we move forward. Um, the geospatial intelligence and training programs are built around uh, the information uh, that all of these systems are collecting every day. Uh, not just how do you take pictures, you know, but understanding, you know, what the pictures are, whether it's electro-optical, uh, infrared, uh, you know, LIDAR imagery, uh, taking those systems basically and applying them to a specific field. Uh, so now all of a sudden farmers have not just pictures, but you know, what do those pictures mean? Uh, you know, law enforcement agencies can understand based on you know, forecasting weather and, and based on uh, being able to track uh, systems and, and track um, targets, if you will, uh, down to a very localized level, again, using the geospatial intelligence information and applying that accordingly uh, to give decision makers a better understanding of, of their world um, as they see it. Uh, we do have the North Aerospace Foundation, which is focused on customized training. Uh, again, it gives us kind of our business arm, if you will, and it really supports us that way. And of course, you know, the National Center for Autonomous Technologies, which again is the reason why we're here today. Uh, a fantastic uh, new uh, operation that we have here at Northern College that is really focused on, you know, what could be around autonomous technologies. So uh, pretty amazing. All right, so just a quick question here. Um, you know, showing showing how long kind of we've been in the, the aviation industry. Uh, when did Northland's Aviation Maintenance Technology Program start? Ah. Well, 1959, we'll, we'll dive into that a little bit more here on the actual slide for uh, the Aviation Maintenance Program. We're very proud of our heritage here, and again, we've been doing this for a very long time. Uh, so again, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the Airframe Park Plan Program here in a minute. Uh, if you go across the entire Aviation Maintenance Training, uh, uh, I guess, a portfolio, if you will, we've got the Aviation Maintenance Technology, which is your Airframe Power Plan Certificate, uh, the Unmanned Aircraft Systems Maintenance Technician Program, which we're focused on today, uh, started in 2011. Uh, from there, we built out the Aviation Maintenance uh, Technician Plus Certificate, uh, which is a great opportunity for uh, those that may already be in the field, um, already have an airframe power plant ticket, uh, maybe looking for you know, sustainment training or you know, kind of to hone their skills and some of the next-gen technologies. Um, it is unique in that it's 100% online. And uh, the nice thing about that is they can get into next-gen avionics, uh, some of the computers and other technologies that really are starting to affect the world uh, more and more every day. Uh, the small UAS aircraft um, system service technician is also an AAS degree. Uh, it's, it's coupled with you know, a field service technician diploma. And the idea behind those two really is to, to provide uh, professional uh, technicians and operators for small UAVs. Uh, so as we look at all the different applications that are out there, again, the goal there is that, you know, we're going to create not just operations or, or pilots, if you will, but folks that can provide uh, quality um, imagery and information for those that are looking for that from small UAS. Hey, Kurt, can you move a little closer to your microphone? We're having a few people that, uh, you know, having a little trouble hearing. Sure, yeah, no problems at all. There we go, that uh, sounds a lot clearer. The UAS and Geospatial Application Certificate, again, is focused specifically on uh, taking imagery from small UAVs and, and applying that in, in various fields, uh, whether that's, you know, an egg field or a law enforcement field or a fire uh, support field. Uh, really just focused on, you know, if I take my drone and I want to go out and, and apply that to a profession I may already be in, uh, that's what that's designed to do is to, you know, teach you how to fly the drone, but also take that imagery and apply it to your individual industry. Um, and then, of course, the geospatial intelligence um, analysts and, and the imagery analyst certificates are focused on just that, the imagery. Uh, so you take the imagery, uh, you, you collect all these great uh, videos and, and from various uh, collection platforms. Um, what do you do with it? How do you take that information and, and couple it with uh, open source information that already exists out there, um, you know, whether that be weather forecasts or understanding 
you know, what other, um, uh, you know, resources are available to different agencies and really taking that all and putting it together in, in a single, um, you know, operational uh, picture, if you will, for a decision maker. And again, that's what that, that entire program is designed to do is to take that information and, uh, and do something with it again across whether it be military or whether it be um, you know, civilian, uh, ag, you name it. So pretty, pretty fantastic operations across the board. Well, that's a pretty comprehensive list of, uh, of programs that uh, we've got here at NCTC. I don't think you're gonna find that anymore else. And uh, one of the things, again, that we're gonna highlight here is our large UAS maintenance program, uh, where you absolutely will not find one like it anywhere else in the country. All right, so again, as you can see, uh, the students are leaning up against a uh, Global Hawk a model that we had. Uh, we actually have had Northrop Grumman as an instrument, uh, instrument uh, partner from the very beginning of, of our projects here. Uh, but basically, uh, you take the airframe power plant licensure, um, all the aviation basics, you know, the environmentals, hydraulics, uh, your navigation systems, you know, understanding all of that core content that really is what makes an aviation maintenance professional. Um, is critical in, in understanding, you know, large UAS, moving that into the next level. Um, as we look at uh, the, the program itself, um, we kind of, we joke around with our students a little bit because it doesn't really make any difference, you know, what field they're going to get into. If they want to go out and work on cars, you know, we do, we've had students that have you know, taken jobs at, at theme parks before, uh, because by the time they get through this program and understand the hydraulics, you know, how they operate, uh, the, the control systems, you know, the electronics, you name it, uh, there are very few um, mechanical uh, devices of any kind that won't make sense to them. Um, again, the, the proficiency are the same, and it doesn't make any difference uh, whether you're looking at a resistor and a toaster oven on your countertop or whether it's in a complex computer. They do the same thing. And again, our goal here is to help uh, students understand and build that foundation of how the technologies work. And so when they get out there and, and they're you know, presented with new technologies, however it may evolve um, over the decades to come, uh, they can build on that foundation and really be successful in the industry. The Large Unmanned Aircraft Systems Maintenance Technician Program, uh, again, that's a little bit of a mouthful, uh, was our initial attempt in 2011 and on uh, to take the, the uh, comprehensive airframe and power plant curricula and, and add to it, you know, take the next gen technologies around satellite communications and, and the advanced composites. Um, all the new computers and, and avionics and networking systems that you want to look at and, and apply that to the airframe power plant licensure so that, you know, as, as these large UAVs take over our national airspace system or become uh, more prevalent there, uh, that we have mechanics that can rely on that, that foundation uh, that the FAA has already presented in an airframe power plant license, um, but also take that to the next level. Um, the FAA is a fantastic organization. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, it's very, very large, and for those of us that work within systems or large organizations, we know that it's not always as nimble as it needs to be, and, and given uh, the technology and how fast it's evolved, uh, our goal with, with this licensure basically is to help um, those students, I guess, uh, stay current uh, with whatever the latest and greatest technologies are, even if it isn't currently a part of the core curriculum or the requirements in the airframe power plant program. All right, let's take a second. We got a couple of questions here. Uh, we got one from Facebook is, what does the employment outlook look like for people getting this training? Um, so I, I think I can probably take this one here for you, Kurt. Um, our, our aviation maintenance folks, uh, as far as I know, we, they, they are, there's more demand than we have students. Uh, so I, I believe we're still at about 100% for our placement rate uh, around our aviation maintenance technology program. Uh, we'll see how, how COVID may impact that uh, at, at the end of the year here. Uh, with our large UAS program, uh, all of our students who can, at this point, get some type of, of clearance. Um, a, a lot of the larger UAS programs right now, uh, when, when you go out into the workforce, uh, you're, you're working DOD contracting, so Department of Defense contracting, you know, with some, some of the great folks out there at, at Northrop Grumman, at General Atomics, uh, you know, Boeing and Lockheed. And right now, they're generally requiring at least being able to get a secret clearance. Uh, so most of our students who've come through, they've uh, been able to obtain that. Uh, have been able to find uh, good work out in the, out in the workforce there. And uh, frankly, they, uh, there's great pay, great benefits, and, and really opportunities to travel quite a bit as well. So uh, I think they're, they're put in a good place. And frankly, when we look at large UAS, and as it starts to commercialize, as it starts to, to come into our national airspace system, that demand is only going to go up. And so the students who come through our program uh, – can can benefit by being there, you know really there on the ground floor when it comes to the commercialization of this um, 
as and even looking at some of the things that we talk about here, you know, we look at composite structures, computer networking, uh, avionics, satcom and radio theory, everything in there really applies to our current aviation maintenance world. Uh, when, when we really look down at things, um, you, you know, all, all the newer aircraft, they're composite aircraft. So, you know, they're, they're very heavy on it. You know, the, the, what was it? The 787 was about more than 50% composites. I believe it may be even up to 70%. And then we look at the, the computers. Everything is computer controlled these days. Uh, so, so getting these fundamental skills, even, even though we call it the UAS maintenance, uh, they, they really go across the board uh, into the, the current and next gen uh, aviation maintenance skill set. So, yeah, no, that's, a, that's a great segue. I mean, as we get into the, the certificates and the requirements, it, it really is important to understand uh, the level of training that these students are going through. Um, so again, those that are familiar with the airframe power plant license, you know, it's already 2,000 hours. Uh, that's it's a required contact hour uh, from the FAA. Um, and the bottom line is, you know, that that in itself is is not for the faint of heart. Uh, if you compare that to typical two-year programs, you're looking at around uh, 1,200 hours or so. Uh, to get through a, a typical two-year program. At 2,000 hours, of course, we're pushing three to even a four-year requirement. And yet they're still getting through it in the same you know, nine-month intervals across two years uh, to, to graduate from that program, which means long days, long hours, a lot of commitment. And again, it, it certainly uh, supports the, the professionalisms, if you will, or the level of professionalism that are required of those students uh, to be successful once they get on the field. Uh, so when we talk about placement, um, industry partners recognize that. You know, if students are coming through this program, if, if they have that a &P ticket in hand, uh, again, getting a job is not an issue. Um, it, it seems like it's you know, long after we are our last student place, you know, we still have folks coming to the table uh, to um, looking for those technicians. Um, on top of that, you know, again, the, the UAS maintenance side, you know, that's another you know, 30 credits or 600 hours. You know, so you're looking at 2,600 hours that students typically are completing in 24 months, uh, which is amazing as you think about uh, the level of training, uh, the types of of technologies that they're they're being exposed to and, and learning about, um, and again, it makes them very uh, very successful and, and very uh, uh, you know able to, to handle whatever industry can throw at them. As you look at the certificates and the requirements, or do you have other questions there? Um, we we actually do have a couple more questions here. Okay. Um, so we talked about our job placements and, and partnerships uh, with with other organizations like General Atomics and Northrop Grumman. Uh, we've got Mike's asking, uh, should I be incorporating a discussion of drone and UAV connectivity? Uh, talking about things like dedicated two-way links. Uh, absolutely. Uh, when, when we start talking uh, operations, even when we're talking small UAS or large UAS, uh, generally we divide the system into three different parts. You've got your airframe. You've got your control station, and then arguably one of the you know very important parts is your data link section, and that's that section that's that's allowing that communication between the aircraft and the ground control station. Whether that ground control station is a simple RC remote or something more complicated like what you'd see with a, a Global Hawk or a Predator system, um, you know that, that takes up a whole trailer um, with, with multiple computers and tons of networking going on. Uh, so absolutely, discussing those those links and, and how it communicates will really give a better understanding. Uh, of your limitations even, uh, even talking small UAS, as we go into a city and we start getting getting multi-pathing off the metal buildings and, and uh, you, you get issues with the compass when you're working uh, on concrete that has a lot of rebar in it, especially with close to the surface. So talking about those things is, is never a detriment. It's always gonna be a, a good thing to give those folks more information, uh, in, in my opinion. So, all right, let's well, see. Absolutely. So, uh, so matriculation to the program offer opportunities for job placement. Yes, we definitely do uh, job placements. And uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, when when you really think about it, between small UAS and large UAS, um, large UAS is a much more formalized structure as of this point. Uh, with small UAS, you have a lot of one-offs, a lot of entrepreneurs going out and and doing their thing. Then you've got some organizations uh, like like Skyscopes. You know, they're, they're a, a growing organization and they've got offices all over the place. So um, it, it's getting easier to have a, a pathway in small UAS uh, than it was in the past. And that'll, that'll continue as more organizations kind of bring their operations in house. Uh, but with large UAS, it's already a very structured environment. Uh, so, so going out and, and working with these organizations is a lot easier. Uh, than working with, you know, several thousand organizations that are doing small UAS work. So, 
other key thing to keep in mind around uh, the uh, replacement specifically, you know, and again, Zach hit on this a little bit before where, you know, we call this a large, you know, unmanned aircraft systems training program. But again, as you can see by the certificates that it's focused on, you know, this, this type of technology is just as prevalent for any other a commercial airliner that's out there. Um, so we have students that go through the drone program, but still end up ultimately placed with organizations like Delta Airlines, where they recognize that the, the next level training that they've received is not only relevant, uh, but, but required for some of the shops that they have, uh, given the new technologies that are being implemented in the aircraft. Um, and again, you know, we look at the, the diploma itself, you've got the power plant license, of course, which we already talked about, um, ASTM, which covers down on a lot of the endorsements around avionics and, and the radio and navigation systems. Um, Cisco, again, people recognize that name, obviously, you know, looking at the IT and infrastructure, uh, the networking components, which are just as relevant, you know, in, in a, um, a complex networking environment in an office building as it is now, you know, when we have Wi-Fi networking with aircraft, uh, but you're now combining that with satellite communications and understanding data links and everything else. So uh, it's, it's pretty amazing when you start thinking about you know, how that applies. Um, you know, Composite, Zach talked a little bit about that already. Um, and we've got, you know, other um, UAS maintenance technician certificates around um, ASTM that really look at um, holistically how well-rounded a, uh, a technician will be or how prepared they will be to support the UAS maintenance industry as a whole. Um, in order to get that certificate, you need to have a fundamental understanding of the airframe power plant license, um, as well as the professionalisms that go into the UAS industry. Um, so again, Can I move back up towards uh, your mic a little bit? Yep, have I backed away from the mic too far again? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's <laughs> okay. okay. Um, that's no, that's that's actually a, a great explanation there, Kurt. And uh, we'll we'll keep looking down. We we're getting tons of interaction on our chat here. Um, so I'm trying to trying to focus on both here. Um, but uh, Laura's talking about uh, asking if we have any apprenticeship programs uh, for for any of these programs. And I'll say that. Uh, we might not have a traditional apprenticeship. However, we do have plenty of opportunities uh, between their first and second year. Uh, we have folks going out all the way, you know, from Alaska to, to local jet centers all over the place to, to work uh, internships during the summer. And then we actually started this past year, we were going to have our very first internship uh, set up with Northrop Grumman over at the Grand Sky facility, which is only just an hour away from us. Uh, however, COVID came into play and, and kind of knocked that down a little bit. So we're hoping as we as we get through this uh, this pandemic that we can open that back up. Uh, Northrop Grumman has been just a great supporting or organization for our programs. Um, we've got a question, what is AAS on the slides? And uh, we apologize about that. Uh, AAS is an Associate of Applied Science. Uh, it's just a, a different type of, of two-year degree there. All right. Uh, yep, no worries. All right, we can go ahead, Kurt. Sounds good. So you see the certificates here, and again, the wide variety of, of uh, technologies that we hit on. So the next logical step is to talk about the accrediting bodies. You know, of course, the FAA, uh, as we look at, you know, aviation as a whole, you know, that's a very, very common name. Um, FCC, which again looks at the communications piece. Um, and then a variety of, of, uh, of um, professional organizations as well as certifying bodies for the certificates that we apply um, in our program. Um, Zach, would you mind talking a little bit about the FAA Assure and the, the CTI initiatives? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the FAA Assure was a, a research, uh, oh, we'll call it a, a, a research initiative from the FAA uh, to be able to go out and answer some basic questions about UAS. Uh, and, and one of the things that, that we helped with here uh, was what they call the A.5. And A.5 was all about the maintenance, modification, and repair of UAS. Uh, what did we find that it, could, uh, that, that it took? How should we structure it? And we were able to give recommendations back to the FAA on, on how that goes. So it was actually great. We were one of two two-year colleges in the country that was a part of it. Uh, most of the folks were, were four-year universities, really big research universities. Uh, so the fact that we were sought out to, to be a part of that was absolutely great. Uh, if you need any information on that, uh, you can look up the final reports. They are up on the, uh, the Ashore website. Uh, so if you just Google FAA Ashore Research, uh, it should bring you to the site that you need. And again, if we're specifically talking about maintenance, you're looking at the A.5 uh, research that was done there. Um, then moving down here, we've got the, uh, the FAA UAS CTI. That's the brand new collegiate training initiative uh, around small UAS at this point. And uh, that initiative was actually written into the 2018 
uh, reauthorization bill for the FAA that said that we needed some type of some type of structure to to bring all these folks together, kind of like what they did with ATC uh, long ago. Um, that really is just getting off the ground. I believe there's over 50 organizations that are currently all the way a part of it, and and that number could be closer to 100 right now. Uh, but I know that there was interest from almost 300, and the first meeting of that group is this afternoon. Uh, if you scroll up in the chat, uh, you will see my email address. So if you have a UAS program, if you're looking at starting a UAS program, uh, then go ahead and shoot me an email. I can send you the information so you can join and, and be a part of that meeting. Um, yeah, I think that answers that on that page. Go ahead, Kurt. Again, as far as the slideshow is concerned, you know, northlandaerospace.com is a place that you can pull a lot of additional information. Um, <clears throat> at the end here, my goal was to show you know, a little bit about you know, the hangar spaces that we have. Uh, we talk about uh, the technologies that go into our training programs and what you need to be successful. Um, it's built around this core, you know, as you can see by the aircraft in that hangar. Um, you know, we, we have a variety of single engine, dual engine, commercial aircraft uh, from a variety of generations, you know, going back all the way to the 40s, um, all the way on up to current and present day. Um, and the reason why we feel like that's relevant and important is because we, we feel it's important that our students don't just read about this stuff in the books, but they actually are able to lay hands on the technologies and, and uh, go through there. So regardless of what they run into in industry, you know, it's unlikely they're going to run into something that they haven't already physically wrenched on or at least been uh, somewhat familiar with as they come through all the programs. Um, as we look at the drone side, again, a little different hangar philosophy there. And and again, I'm sure you recognize that the aircraft are quite a bit smaller on this side of the fence. Uh, but I'm actually going to allow Zach to go around the room here as I uh, look at those aircraft specifically and basically how they fit within the training program. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, what you see straight in the center of your screen there is our Inacon Mini Falcon. Uh, the Mini Falcon has really been the heart of our program. And we'll talk just a little bit uh, in just a moment about what it took to get that system here. Uh, <laughs> because that... That took quite a bit of juggling and lots of red tape. And uh, we got to remember this is uh, 2012 that we really, well, 2011 when we started the program. Um, and, you know, boy, it was quite a process to get it here. So, again, we'll talk about that here in just a minute. Uh, but if we look down to the left of the screen, oh, we're going to go the other way. Okay. Oh, that's fine. After this. <laughs> All right, so centered there, we've got a BAT-12 from Northrop Grumman, and I, I repeatedly said how much Northrop Grumman supports our program. Uh, well, I can tell you that we had an agreement in place uh, where Northrop Grumman basically brought in $18 million of worth of equipment, uh, basically their entire BAT program, uh, to house here at Northland. And so our students were able to, to really get a feel for, for all the, the other aircraft out there. Uh, you can also see right next to that, we've got a, it's basically a, a remake of the Yamaha R-Max. It's called an R-Bat is what uh, Northrop Grumman dubbed it. Um, great piece of equipment. Uh, helicopter flies for about an hour or so uh, with an extended tank. You can fly up to three. Uh, I'd say it's really a great piece of equipment. And, and again, it's slightly different than the other two pieces we have. So we really get to see some differences between systems. Uh, but more importantly, we get to see uh, a lot of the ways that these systems are the same, even though they look completely different. Uh, those, those foundational building blocks that we teach here are, are exactly for that purpose because at the end of the day, we've got a data link section, we've got a control station, and we've got an aircraft, and, and really the physics uh, behind it are, are straight physics. I mean, there, there's nothing, nothing too crazy about any of these, uh, so showing how they relate together and how the functional blocks of information that we give you can cross platforms is really a, a great thing for our students here. Uh, so looking next to that, we have a launcher for that bat system. If you notice that that art or that bat that was sitting there did not have any landing gear, so it uses a, a launcher that's kind of a, a mixture of pneumatics and hydraulics. Um, so we've got that uh, that there that they can take a look at, they can wrench on, and and one of the great things is when Northrop Grumman wanted to use some of this equipment to demo with. Uh, with customers, they'd actually bring engineers and technicians here on site, and our students were able to work right alongside them and helping them doing the, the modifications and, and the inspections that were necessary before bringing it back out into the field. Um, so again, Northrop Grumman has just been great to us here. Um, you can see the, uh, some students there working on a, another launcher, and that launcher there is actually a one-off, uh, I believe it was the Department of the Navy, uh, that we got that from, 
And what had happened is uh, the Scan Eagle platform that I know a few of you are probably familiar with uh, had two pieces of equipment that they used for launch and recovery. It had one for launch, one for recovery. And the Navy wanted to know, hey, can we make one that does both jobs? And so this is actually it. It was a great donation that we got uh, from those folks over there. And uh, it's now sitting in our hangar. And again, we have students setting it up, tearing it down, taking a look at things, uh, seeing how it works together. And then last, you can see a, another launcher. This is much like the first launcher that you saw that was painted tan. Uh, this is just out in its, in its expanded state. Uh, so the other one was in a transport state. This one here is in, the, uh, is in the operational state is what it is. So, and then you can see back in the corner, we've got a ground control station set up and that ground control station uh, corresponds with our mini Falcon system. Um, so again, we've, we've had some really great donations. We've had some, some great sponsors and, and relationships uh, with folks out at you know, Northrop Grumman and General Atomics and, and others. So um, they've, they've really yeah. helped us out. So as we talk about equipment in general in, in launching a new program, especially a large uh, UAS program, you, you really have to have uh, the partnerships with, with the manufacturers that are out there. Uh, the, the comment Zach was making earlier, you know, we, when we launched this thing in 2011, it was a very different world. You know, talking through, um, you know, what was available. And, and first, you know, first, the first conversation was, hey, you go and say unmanned systems or drones or UAS to anyone, and they look at you like you have three heads. You had to first communicate what it was, because again, you know, it's, it seems odd today, because it's much more common knowledge and, and you know, it's affected more of the, the population. But back then, uh, you know, it was, it was a real uh, conversation just to help, help them understand what we were talking about. And the next joke for us was, you know, we had multi-millions of dollars from grant programs that we were looking to to buy drones with and we couldn't buy one no matter where we went it was one of those situations where you just didn't have access uh, that the equipment that was built had a purpose and uh, it was already on its way out the door it was hard to get into the uh, the manufacturing cycle with the major manufacturers that that were able to work with us um, and again it was just a very different world back then so we actually partnered with an organization called Inacon uh, from Israel and I uh, had to work through a congressional mandate to get our first major systems here um, in order to uh, to get approval and to get them shipped on site uh, which actually worked out to be uh, in our favor in the long run uh, because the, the systems were never under any kind of military contract or, or, or military purpose. So uh, we were able to be a little more flexible with some of our training programs here that, you know, those flexibilities might not have been afforded to other uh, organizations or even to ourselves had we had um, military equipment or other, other types of systems that might have been available at the time. So, uh, but again, we, we, uh, we really enjoyed the first couple of years here uh, bringing equipment together. It was a nonstop hunt, a nonstop shop, a nonstop conversation with our partners uh, to, uh, to work those relationships and ultimately uh, to get systems on site. Yeah, so one of the fun things about this is not only did it take us about two years to get this system on site, um, where our, our Israeli partners in Icon were absolutely great. It was sitting on the docks in Israel. It was just waiting for all the red tape on our end of, the, uh, on our end of it there. Um, but so the, for those first two years, for, for those out there, you know, uh, Kurt did say that, you know, we had millions of dollars and, you know, we went out and we got this grant for $5 million to start this program. And I know that's not something that, that we can all have, have easy access to. Uh, so I wanted to kind of highlight that our first two years, we didn't have this equipment. We were able to run these programs based on theory and looking at small UAS to, to really show some of that theory. And then of course we relied on, on some other partnerships to be able to go out and, and take a look at their, at their systems. Uh, you know, we've got the Grand Forks Air Force Base uh, not too far away from us here. Uh, they've been great hosts multiple times. We still do field trips out there. Um, although this past summer, again, uh, with, with COVID going on, that's been, uh, that, that was held off this summer. Uh, but they take us out there and they show us their global hawks. Uh, the, the border patrol right next door that, that's working out of the air base there, uh, you know, they're flying uh, predator variants. And, and so they were able to, to take us out there and, and brief us on what they do, show us their operations center, talk to their maintenance personnel, uh, which was great getting students in front of folks who, who are doing the job that they want to do. Uh, it's always exciting. It's always, you know, leaves them with a good feeling. Um, and then further, now we've got Grand Sky, which is just right on the other side of the of the uh, the runway on the airbase there. And you've got Northrop Grumman and General Atomics running there. And again, they, they've all been so supportive. Uh, they all realize that, you know, this this pipeline right now, they're, a lot of times they're pulling people from the military. And that pipeline, it's it's relatively small. So we need to broaden that out. We need to to be able to staff all of their places, all of their, uh, you know, whether, whether they're here in the continental United States or, uh, you know, out in the world. Um, 
we, we've got to be able to to develop that pipeline uh, to, to be able to fill those slots for them so they can continue to do business the way they need to. Uh, so it's it's been it's been quite the journey. Um, so if you are looking uh, at starting a large UAS program and, and you don't quite have access to those funds yet, there's still ways around it. And really, there's still ways that you can integrate some of this uh, from your aviation maintenance training school if you have one. Uh, and then you can always reach out to us and we're happy to help. Uh, as, as NCAT, one of the things that we do is we look at, at helping programs stand up or helping schools stand up programs uh, that will meet these needs in the autonomous technology sector. So, all right, Kurt, I'm um, looking here in the chat and I'm not seeing too much new. There was one question earlier that I'll, I'll go ahead and, and come back to. Um, this program or this question was about insurance. And so, Kurt, I'm going to let you take this one as soon as I get back up to it. All right, so how does the college deal with insurance for their UAV program, and do the students have individual insurance? So maybe we can talk about that as the large UAS and the small UAS side, two separate there? Absolutely. So on the large UAS side of the house, um, the beauty of being a part of the Minnesota state system is that, you know, there are certain um, there are liabilities that, that we are, are concerned and aren't concerned with because of the, the size of the system, um, and of course the fact that, that uh, you know, is a, is a very large system. So we are actually able to do a certain amount of self-insurance on the liability side uh, for the systems that we can't self-insure. And of course, a lot of these drones, given the, the, the size of them and, and uh, the cost of them, um, or the fact that we just can't replace them, um, you know, it's, it's significant dollars. So in that case, we do carry separate insurance policies uh, that cover down on the aircraft themselves. Um, during the operations uh, and the actual training itself, again, that's all covered under the standard um, policies that we have in place for liability for the state of Minnesota uh, for students uh, based on the risk and, and the type of work that they're doing here at the college. Uh, we also have a significant amount of risk management processes and procedures in place uh, to mitigate those risks, uh, much like you know, whether we're taxing the aircraft down the runway or whether they're working on you know, a, a system where they have a prop spinning on the back of you know, the intercon system there. Um, again, those risks are always very real and very um, aware as far as the, the faculty and the, and the, uh, the leadership at the various sites are concerned. Um, on the small UAS side of the house, again, we do also insure our drones individually on that case for operations um, and for flight. And again, you know, there, there's a myriad of um, insurance providers that are out there that can help provide that, uh, that same type of policy in order to make sure that you're covered both professionally and for the liability side if there was ever any um, incidents that took place. Um, in both cases, uh, students are covered under our policies, they're not required to carry their own insurance. Um, and so it's, it's something that the college Bears and not something we pass on to the students. Oh, well, that's great, Kurt. Um, all right, so we got a couple more questions that came in. So one of the ones we got is, uh, does the college have a competitive drone club? Uh, at this moment, no, we do not. Uh, all of our clubs are student driven. Uh, so we, we, they have to take the initiative and, and get that done. And I know there was talk about doing it, uh, but at the, as of this point, that has not come to fruition. Uh, that being said, there are a few local clubs here within about a, an hour radius uh, where they go out and then they're, you know, they're road across FPV clubs. Uh, we've got UND right down the road. They've got a club there and they actually have been hosting the collegiate, uh, the UAS collegiate drone uh, championships the last two years there. Uh, we'll see what what uh, what this next year brings. Uh, so there is opportunity here in the area to to go out and and fly with your friends uh, or or meet new friends flying. Uh, so there there is that. All right. Um, so next we have from uh, Hassan Edwards. Or uh, what partnership programs do you have at the high school level, and do we offer online courses for high school students? Um, yes, so we have got a fairly extensive college and the high school program here at Northland College, uh, and we're always looking for more, uh, more folks to partner with. Uh, that being said, outside of the really formal partnerships, uh, Northland College, along with the National Center for Autonomous Technologies, uh, we have plenty of programs out there that's really focused on, on high school students and educators, uh, and even down to the middle school and, and sometimes elementary level. So we run summer camps uh, for students in the, in the summertime. Uh, we're looking at more and more of those and expanding those out. Uh, again, with, with the pandemic, it's, it's been a little tough this year for the hands-on stuff for students. Uh, that being said, on the educator side of the house, we have worked on, on plenty of, of educator workshops. If you go take a look at our website, again, it's ncatech.org. 
And uh, we've got tons of videos out there from workshops that we put on for educators. Uh, really spooling up educators on autonomous technology is one of our, our large missions here. We've got to drive that interest when students are young. They've got to know that the opportunities out there exist. And unless we, uh, we put this technology in front of them, it's going to be really hard for them, for them to do that. Um, so yeah, so we've got formal and informal stuff. Um, We'll happily talk to you about programs. We've got curriculum. We can point you to other curriculum. And if you're looking for recommendations for, you know, what type of aircraft should I use? Uh, how should I set this up? What should I talk about? Or how should I talk to my administrator? Uh, even though I happen to have a great administrator that's been really supportive, I know some of you folks maybe uh, have administrators that are a little skeptical. Uh, so we'll happily talk to you about how to talk to them, what to talk to them about, uh, kind of what to highlight. Uh, so there's, there's, plenty of stuff that, that we can do to help you at the high school and, and middle school level. Uh, and we'd love to, to talk to your class. We can do a Zoom meeting to, to come in and, and answer any questions your students may have, talk about our programs, or just talk about UAS in general. Uh, if you haven't noticed, I can talk about UAS all day long and I'll happily do it. Uh, this guy pays me to do it. Uh, so, so it just makes it even sweeter. So. All right, and who should I reach out to to begin the partnership process? Again, you can reach out to me. Uh, just in case you don't see it in the chat, I will throw my email in there. Uh, please reach out at any time, and I'll, I'll respond to you as soon as I can. And yeah, whether, we're, whether we're talking about you know, college and high school type opportunities, uh, educator workshops and professional development opportunities, or actual articulation agreements, again, we, we have models for each. And based on the credentials of the faculty or the, or the instructors, whether it's K-12 or whether it's you know, other colleges that are out there, uh, we're very interested and very willing. Um, and again, it's been our philosophy since the very beginning uh, to, to partner with as many um, and interested and, and enthusiastic folks as we can. Um, again, there just simply is not enough uh, resource out there as it relates to uh, educational programs, specifically around large UAVs um, and large, large UAS systems. Uh, so bottom line, you know, if you're interested, uh, reach out to Zach Nicklin. Uh, again, he can point you in the right direction both for Northland College as well as the NCAT uh, to get things moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. I might not have all the answers, but boy, I bet I can find most of them. So, um, so all right, and, and we do have a lot of educators here. So once again, I'm going to point you back to our website, uh, both the NorthlandCollege.edu uh, website, where you can look at our programs and, and some of the things we have going on, uh, but also our National Center for Autonomous Technologies, ncatech.org. Uh, if you go on there, and, and again, uh, with, with the number of educators we seem to have in here, um, look at our resources page. We've got professional development opportunities uh, we've got the, the ability for you to go out and identify the professional uh, development opportunity you want and for us to, to help with that cost. Um, we've got a, an ability to rent out equipment. Uh, we're looking at equipment sharing and, and things like that. So uh, take a look at our website. Uh, take a look at all the things we have going on. And if you have any questions, please reach out. Uh, so I'm not seeing any more here and I've not seen any ported in from our Facebook Live at this point. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and wrap things up here, unless I see a question in the next second or two. Well, we're waiting, Zach. Thank you again. Yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak today. And uh, again, uh, fantastic to be excited about you know, where, where the NCAT's headed and, and again, uh, where the, the UA, UA, uh, S, UAS industry is headed as a whole. So again, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Kurt, and uh, I really appreciate having you out here. All these folks uh, appreciate listening to, to what you have going on and what you have to say. So uh, thank you very much for spending your morning with us. To all our, our attendees, our participants, thank you very much for taking the time out of your day to, to listen to us chat about what we have going on and, and some of the issues that we had with starting a program. Again, any more questions, please reach out and, and see us. Um, I see a reminder to see videos online. Uh, if you look at our Facebook page, I'm willing to bet uh, the team's headed up pretty quick after our, our live Facebook feed ends. Uh, so if you look at the National Center for Autonomous Technologies on Facebook, uh, we should have it up there. Uh, outside of that, looking at our resources page on, uh, at, at ncatech.org, uh, that, that'll have tons of videos there. Plus, I'm sure this one will be added uh, you know, as soon as the, the team possibly can. Um, so again, thank you, Kurt. Thank you, participants. And thank you to my team that's out there in the background making this happen. Uh, we got Zach from, from our IT side of the house, uh, Chelsea doing our marketing. We've got uh, Haley answering uh, questions over from Facebook and then bring them over to us. And then, of course, we've got the executive team, uh, John Beck and Anton Berge, uh, all of us coming together to work this in the background. So uh, thank you all very much. 
have yourself a great day and we'll see you tomorrow for our next uh, installment. And that's kind of really focused on, on the education side. We'll have a great panelist uh, that, that's talking that's seven to eight o'clock uh, Central Standard Time tomorrow night. So thank you all, you all have a great day.